Hello everyone, Larry WD0AKX. Today I'm going to take you through the operation of a Yesu FRG7, also known as a Frog 7 or Froggy 7. These were made in the 1970s, mid 70s to late 70s by Yesu. And also, the one I have has the Sears label on it. They were sold by Sears at the time also, with a little different color scheme on the housing. Now you have to realize in the 1970s, uh, most TAM radio equipment did not cover the shortwave spectrum at all. So these were kind of designed as a stand beside in the shack uh, to the other HF gear in your shack so you could monitor the shortwave spectrum. So these were a nice addition to the shack as well as good for any SWLs. Now if you're looking to get into ham radio today, this probably isn't that great for you because you probably want to stick with the full transceiver but these make a good radio for shortwave listening general coverage very stable and uh, they just work very well still fun to use and they cover from about 0.5 megahertz all the way up to 29.9 megahertz now back in the day when these were new they sold for about three hundred dollars if you find one out there uh, these days, uh, be sure and ask a lot of questions about its working condition. Realize that the electrolytic capacitors are aging in them. They are a solid state radio, no tubes, but they are a fun radio to play with and they are a hands-on radio. I want to stress that. A lot of fiddling with the dials and uh, controls as you change frequencies, unlike some of today's modern receivers where you just dial up the frequency and uh, you're there. So if you like hands-on, you'll like this radio. Um, this video is mainly to show you kind of the operation of the radio, so let's check that out. Looking inside the radio, I see several electrolytic capacitors, and they're becoming dated. It's a good idea to replace old uh, electrolytic capacitors. So I went online and found uh, VE3PVS, who had a supply of capacitors, a capacitor kit made just for this radio that he put together. So I went ahead and ordered those. All the electrolytic capacitors are located on the IF and AF board in the radio here. The other boards do not have any electrolytics, but we're going to go ahead and replace all the electrolytics on that board. Looking around inside the radio, this is the IF and AF unit, and there's uh, battery holders for internal batteries, and this is the RF unit, and then the oscillator and tuning. And here you can see the handful of electrolytic capacitors that I replaced. It took me a couple hours to go through and replace those, but it'll be worth it. I also wanted to improve the lighting on the S-meter. Since the S-meter was not lit up all that great, uh, I went ahead with some LED strip lights and powered them. I found a spot on the board here right off the power supply, the main power supply. These, these are strip uh, LED lights. I cut this section off to use above the meter, and you can see how much brighter the meter looks now. And then we come over to the right. And this is our on-off power switch on the radio, which is pretty obvious. And then you can also turn the lighting on or off. Now I have my LED lights hooked up to the power supply before the switch, so that always stays on. But the LED lights don't draw much current there at all, very little. So uh, that is fine with me. Now the main reason they had the light switch on the radio was if you were going to run it on battery power, you can install... Uh, internal batteries here if you want to operate it that way and then you might want to save on battery consumption by turning your lights off and let me turn my spotlight off here so you can see the internal lights on the frequency dial here there they show up better this way and that's what that looks like and I'm on the 40 meter ham band right now I'll show you more about the tuning shortly the volume control here is pretty self-explanatory I guess and then our mode selector switch. Upper sideband CW, lower sideband or AM mode, and AM mode with an automatic noise limiter, ANL circuit. If you uh, experience a lot of uh, local uh, interference, uh, power line noise or pulsing noise, something like that, you might want to try it in that mode. Usually above uh, 10 megahertz on ham radio anyhow, uh, upper sideband mode is used mostly and lower sideband is generally used below 10 megahertz so you can kind of think of it that way and um, this is where you usually want to be if you're copying Morse code or CW. Now when you have a signal tuned in 
on frequency. You first dial it in on the main dial here. But you can do some fine tuning with the fine tuning control here, as you'll notice. Now the tone control, you kind of have to use your ears to uh, determine what you like to listen to, but by changing that you can make it uh, just responsive to the lower frequency range. I like it in normal most of the time. Or you can go narrow and it just changes the audio frequency response oh, of the radio. So yeah, yeah, you sound great also. Solid 5.9 uh, here in New Hampshire. Well, no, the Flex 6300 was about a KW, and, uh, and the antenna is the old high-gain, high-power, which two of the states. Now, the radio has a built-in attenuator, and that's what the ATT st uh, stands for. It's kind of confusing. You'd think... Uh, if you want it in DX mode, that would be for the longest distance. But actually, normal mode is for receiving um, with the most sensitivity on the radio. And DX puts on a little bit of attenuation. As you can see by the S meter, maybe. Drops it down a little, a little less sensitive. And then the local position drops it down even more, more attenuation. So the attenuator is used uh, for nearby strong signals or any strong signals. Sometimes on the shortwave bands you'll have some uh, very strong signals and they tend to overload the radio. So that's where these other positions may help you out. Okay, I'm on 40 meters CW in the CW part of the band now. You hear how that sounds. And sometimes on CW you might want to change the tone control to the low position here. Kind of eliminate the signals off to the side a little bit more. Or possibly the narrow. Okay, and that brings us over to our band selector switch. We uh, need to decide what band we want to listen to. So right now I'm on the 40 meter ham band just above 7 megahertz so that's between the on position 3 here or C 4 to, to 11 megahertz so I select uh, position C and then what I need to do before I can do anything here is uh, come up to the megahertz control here and you'll notice the 7 and that's where I want to be at 7 megahertz and I need to tune this precisely until this lock LED goes out. Now it's, it seems just backwards. It seemed like you'd want that to be on when you're locked in, but it's just backwards here. You want the light to be off or else you're probably not going to hear anything. So when you're tuning, and that goes for each segment of the band here. Whenever you change band positions, you need to change the megahertz control to correspond with the range you want to be on. And like I say right now, I'm on the 7. So what I do with my dial here now, take the 7 and add what I see on the dial. And I want to clear that up just a little more. Um, each time you change by megahertz, you, will, you need to change this. So if I go from 7 megahertz to 8 megahertz, 8 megahertz section here, even though this band covers from 4 to 11 megahertz, I need to change this to correspond to which uh, megahertz segment I want to be on. So now I am locked on to 8 megahertz. And I would add, uh, take 8 and add my dial reading to that to give me my frequency. So let's go back to 7 here. You can hear how the signal can't be heard unless I'm in the right segment there. And you want to kind of peak the signal there too with the lock. And then also, let's move over to the pre-select here. You'll see uh, that's highlighted now near 7 here, and that's where I'm at. On 7 on here, I want to look for 7 over here on the pre-selector, 7 megahertz. And watch the S-meter. I need to peak the signal there. It's kind of broad here, but you can get a definite peak. And every time you change frequencies by very far, you need to re-peak the pre-selector. That's very important. That's why this radio does take a lot of hands-on. So if you like the hands-on type radios, this is it. So now 
you can see I'm at 7 and I'll add this so I'm actually uh, about 7.038 or so and now I'll show you something else if you know uh, exactly the frequency of the station you're listening to you can tune to station WWV of course on shortwave uh, 2.5, 5, 10, 15, 20 and sometimes 25 megahertz and that is exact and you can take and tweak the dial here. Now you'll see it, this is the dial set. If I move that, my little indicator moves back and forth here. So if you happen to know the exact frequency, you can adjust this, but it can change slightly over all the bands. But usually once you get this set up correctly uh, with WWV, I would recommend, then you can pretty much leave it set. Or um, you could also do it with the local uh, AM broadcast station. Okay, now just uh, one last time so we're clear on the tuning. I'm at 7, and let's dial up here. And there I would be at 7.1 megahertz. 7100 kilohertz. There would be 7150, 7.2. Let's just tune around a bit here. I'll show you how the tuning works. Now let's try another band. It's evening time here, so we'll try to go down to the 80 meter ham band, uh, 3.5 to 4 megahertz. So what we won't need to do is switch to position B here, 1.6 to 4, and we want to tune this to the 3 megahertz position. You can see when the lock light goes out. And then we need to come over to the select and we're looking for 3 megahertz here. You can hear how that peaked up. Okay, then we need to take the 3 and add this to the 3. So we're at 3.3 uh, 3 or so there. Let's go way up here up into the ham band part section. And then we need to come back to the pre-selector and you'll see we need to retouch that up. And now we should hear some signals and we need to be in the lower side band. On this band it's below 10 megahertz and I was on the CW position because we were on 40 meter CW there earlier so I was on the CW. We'll come to the lower. Should be able to tune in some signals. Okay, I'm going to tune in to my local AM radio broadcast station on 1450 kilohertz. And I need to come down to position A between the 0.5 and 1.6 megahertz position here and I go to megahertz and I want to align that in the 1 megahertz position and I want to add to the dial 450 so there's 450, 1450 kilohertz and I need to adjust the pre-selector to peak the signal and you'll notice I'm in local position here I have the attenuator turned on since this local station is uh, only about a mile away from me, the broadcast tower. So I'll show you what happens and what the attenuator is for. Listen to that. There's in the normal position, no attenuation. You'll hear the audio is very distorted. And there it sounds good. That's the reason for an attenuator to knock the signal down if you're close to a transmitter so it does not overload the receiver. Like I say, this is a hands-on radio. And I'll say it again. You need to play with several controls as you're tuning across the bands to uh, make things work as they're supposed to. Uh, so if that's not for you, this isn't the radio for you. But if you like hands-on, this is it. And it's kind of fun. There's a lot to hear on shortwave radio other than the ham bands. You know, if you're... Uh, in the ham radio and have never checked out the shortwave bands in between all those ham bands. There's a lot of stuff out there. You never know what you're going to hear.
I'm uh, just above 6 megahertz here now, 6.1 there. <laughs> Notice I keep tweaking the pre-selector as I go. Certainly in Havana, perhaps in the country, which opened a year and a half ago. At now, with a lot of radios, I like to add an external speaker. Uh, I find the internal ones don't sound all that great. But in this radio, the speaker sounds pretty decent. And I'm, I'm pretty much satisfied with the internal speaker here. So um, an external one may sound a little bit better, but uh, this isn't too bad. So I'm not too worried about it. And on the right here, you'll see there's a record jack if you want to hook the radio up to a tape recorder or another device. Uh, maybe you could use this to uh, uh, hook into the computer, maybe. Uh, I haven't looked into that, but I'm sure you could. And the headphone jack. We'll take a look at the rear panel here quickly. First of all, you can open this up if you want to install in internal batteries, uh, D cells, I believe it takes. I don't remember how many offhand, but you can do that. Or there's an external DC input jack here for 12 volts. External speaker jack. And your main antenna connector for shortwave. And a fuse and power, of course. Now, over here, there's a shortwave 1 terminal and a broadcast terminal, BC. Now, if you want to hook up a long wire for just the broadcast band, you'd hook it here. And a long wire for shortwave, you'd just tie it in here. However, this uh, I noticed the shortwave 1 terminal and my in internal antenna switch or antenna connector terminal for the SO239 connector here are uh, tied together. So, by putting a jumper across here from the broadcast to the shortwave 1 position uh, you include the broadcast band into this um, SO239 connection so whatever you hook up for an antenna here say you hook it into your dipole antenna or something uh, that will connect to the broadcast band in the radio so you don't have to run a separate wire for broadcast here so that's uh, this actually takes care of both of these terminals here so you can use one main antenna and then this is a ground connection and an external mute. If you run a separate transmitter, you can mute the radio using this terminal. So there we have it. A little look at the Yesu Frog 7 from the 1970s, a general coverage receiver. Fun radio. Uh, I hope you found this helpful. And stay tuned. I hope to have more videos to come. I always appreciate you watching. So for now, 7-3.